ones live. Okay, this is a very needed message, at least for me. So I hope some of you could benefit from this. For those of you who are, um, for those of you who need some pep in your step or need some encouragement to move forward, um, this is very inspiring and encouraging. So um, get your Bibles open to Ezekiel chapter 37. Before we get started, let's go ahead and go into a prayer, okay? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, I thank you for another opportunity of sharing your word um, today with those who are listening to this um, recording. Lord, we um, pray that this message is well received. Lord, we pray that the listeners have eyes to see and ears to hear today, Lord. We thank you that this message has been blessed, Lord. We thank you um, for all the things that you're doing with this ministry, Lord. We thank you for the people that you brought to this ministry, Lord, who have gained and obtained a lot of information, Lord. Thanks to... Um, your blessed Holy Spirit that has led me into all truth, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We ask that your spirit move through the airwaves right now, Lord, and touch those lives that are listening to this message right now in the name of Yeshua, Lord. We pray that this message blesses those those souls who are who are thirsty and who are um, ready to receive this wonderful word. Um, and we just thank you, Lord, for their presence, Lord. We thank you for, um, again, all that you are doing right now. We give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise right now. Yeshua's name we say amen okay so again um folks we're going to be looking at ezekiel chapter 37 okay okay so for those of you who um who are familiar with the, the history of israel um israel right now is um basically under when you hear about Jacob's trouble in the Bible, they're basically talking about the state of Israel. Okay, so all eyes are on Israel, right? The nation of Israel right now. But this is symbolic. It's not necessarily, it's the nation in a sense, but it's really the people that make up Israel. And the people that make up Israel are, are technically the people of color. They're not really the people that's in, in, the, in, um, in the nation of Israel. It's more so the people that make it up, okay? So if you listen to any of my videos, You've heard me say before that the people of color um, are Israel. Okay, so people are coming to um, people are beginning to come to themselves. They're beginning to be, become aware of who they are and um, their purpose. Now people are awakening, experiencing spiritual awakenings. And with that being said, um, Bible prophecy is being played out right now because, like I said, everyone is looking at the state of Israel because Israel is going to be the driving force as to what happens and things that come to play in terms of Bible prophecy. So what we see right now is a lot of persecutions happening involving the state of Israel. A lot of you don't see it. Some of you may not see it because some of you, like I said, some of this, these things that are happening are all spiritual. Okay. So unless you are um, really in tune in, with, in terms of what's happening in the spirit, um, you won't really know. It'll like go right over your head. You'll think it's just an, an ordinary day. But meanwhile, you're catching all this hell. And you can't understand why. Well, it's because of the afflictions that are occurring in the state of Israel. And what I say, again, what I mean by that is the afflictions that are occurring as a result of the people that make up Israel. Okay? Meaning you, meaning uh, myself, um, any of your family members, and so, and so forth. Okay? So these are the things that we're experiencing right now. We're, we're receiving heavy persecutions. Why? Because Israel has the uh, promise of redemption. Okay, the Lord said that he's going to redeem Israel out of all their troubles. So this means that we're going to be basically given a, a pass. So because, why? Because God says that Israel is the apple of his eye. So that, that being said, Israel is going to kind of get a pass for um, all of the things that they've done in the, in, the, in the past. If you understand their history, Israel played the harlot. Okay, for those of you who don't know. And what I mean by that, I'm speaking of symbolically. I'm not really speaking of like they were like the whores or whatever, they basically, they basically worship false gods, okay? So a covenant was made with the Lord. We see this being played out back in Exodus. If you look at the book of Exodus, when Moses led the Israelites out of the out of captivity, out of the land of Egypt, um, the Lord made a covenant with Israel, saying that they should worship no other gods, that he would be their God. This is where the Ten Commandments came into place. But Israel, along the, somewhere along the lines, became a harlot in which they basically broke the covenant and they engaged in idolatry, okay? 
worship of false gods. So when the Lord says they, they played the harlot, he's meaning in the sense of they basically cheated on him. In the sense of when you look at it in terms of a relationship, relationship perspective, and, you know, Israel had a relationship with the Lord, okay? And they broke that relationship by going into um, worship other gods. So as a result of that, they broke the covenant, okay? They were unfaithful. They were found to be unfaithful. They were found to be disloyal. And as a result of that, they played the harlot. That's what the, he means by that. You worshiped, you worshiped false gods. You said to the tree that you are my father. You know, things like that. You, you um, worship wood instead of worshiping the true and living God, the God that gives salvation, the God that redeems. And so this is what our ancestors did. And as a result of today, what we see happening today is that Israel be, is being punished for um, things that happen um, as a result of that covenant being broken. So we see like the um, curses that were issued in uh, Deuteronomy, the curses and the blessings. The curses were if they broke the covenant, um, the generations to come to generations to follow would be cursed as a result of them breaking the covenant, which we are seeing today right now happening. But that's about to come to a close. Okay, but we're seeing this, um, all of this being fulfilled. Like when you see all of these curses, like with sicknesses and so forth, all of these are generational curses that we're, that we're experiencing. When you see um, poverty, oppression, um, lack, and, and so forth, you know, when you see the uh, widows and when you see the um, single parent family homes, these are all results of curses. That Why? Because based off of what our ancestors did, they broke the covenant. Okay, you broke the oath, you broke the covenant that the Lord said that if you... If you keep me as your God, if you don't, if you worship, uh, if you keep me as your God and you're faithful to me, I will bless you. And you can look at those in detail in Deuteronomy. I think it's explained thoroughly in Deuteronomy chapter 28, I believe it is. But those were the curses and those were the blessings that are spelled out in Deuteronomy chapter 28. <clears throat> I apologize for the hoarseness, guys. Um, but that's some of the things that we had to... Um, that we're enduring right now, but it's coming to a close. If you look at Daniel chapter um, nine, uh, where it talks about um, finishing up the transgression, the seventy-year prophecy, all of that is coming to a close. Where Israel is going to be redeemed, they're going to be forgiven of their sins, they're going to be redeemed, they're going to be restored. Okay, but we want to talk about dry, dry bones live because this this takes us to this point right now. What's happening with Israel? All right, so a lot of persecutions are taking place. They're happening silently. People don't realize that there is a lot, of, like I said before, a lot of you don't realize that you are Israel. You represent Israel. And you're receiving these persecutions silently. You don't know how to deal with them. You don't know what it is. You don't even know that they're persecutions. You're thinking it's just some run of bad luck. Well, it's you being persecuted. You just don't know who you are. And these persecutions are basically isolating you. They're backing you against the wall. They're um, coming in the form of sicknesses. They're coming in the form of spells. They're coming in the form of witchcraft. They're coming in all different um, various forms. And they're pinning you to the wall, um, socially isolating you, okay, where um, you're finding things that are invisible that you don't know, that you don't know, that you can't comprehend, that you can't understand, okay, because you lack ignorance, you're ignorant in that area, okay, so you don't understand who you are as a people, you don't understand who you are as, and what your heritage consists of, so a lot of the, a lot of times this goes unnoticed. And um, a lot of times, unfortunately, people perish as a result of it because the trials that they're facing and the storms that they're going through are so um, silent and, and to the point where it, you're isolated because you're embarrassed to talk about it. You're embarrassed to talk about the things that you're, that you're being presented with because they seem unreal, because it seems like um, you're in it by yourself or it seems like it's something that, happened, that's, that you're making up in your head that doesn't seem to be the truth. When actually it is the truth, you are fighting a spiritual battle that you can't understand or comprehend because it's an invisible, it's an, an invisible battle. Okay, with an invisible, um, with an invisible source. So, you know, somewhere along the line, you become restless, you become weary, um, you lose hope, you lose faith. A lot of times, you don't even call on the name of the Lord because you don't believe that you're in a battle like that where you can call on Him. Okay, so you just think it's, like I said, some running luck, some bad luck, or something like that. And that's where a lot of people are perishing at, because they need to start calling on the name of the Lord. And they need to recognize that this is a spiritual battle. And they need to recognize that um, you can't fight it. You, you have to put it in the hands of the Lord. Okay, so let's talk about this in Ezekiel chapter 37. So it says, and this is uh, 37, 
the prophet, <clears throat> the prophet Ezekiel. So it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. So to me, it sounds like he's in some sort of, even though it says he's in a valley, it seems like he's in some sort of graveyard or something to me. It seems like a place where bones would be, a place where the dead would be, right? All right. So then it says, then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So the Lord is posing the question to Ezekiel. Okay, the Ezekiel is a prophet, all right? So the Lord is asking him a question, like, can these bones live? What do you think? Can, they, can these bones live? And so Ezekiel is like, I answered, Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you. And bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so it looks like something is trying to be proven here. It looks like, okay, it looks like a, a few things are happening in this when you when you read this um, in its entirety. It seems like the Lord, when he brings, when he does does all of these things that he said that he would do for, for to these bones, he's basically showing. Those bones that were dead, that were, you know, this bones before they became, uh, before they uh, uh, were put the sinews on them, before they got breath put into them, before they got the flesh put on them. He's letting it know, hey, I just formed you out of bones. I just formed you out of something that were bones. So I'm, I'm basically proving to you that I put you together so that you can know that I'm Lord, that I'm the Lord. He's also proving it to Ezekiel as well because he asked Ezekiel the question, basically testing Ezekiel's faith and asking him, posing him a question. Ezekiel, do you think that I'm able to do this? Do you think that I can put this together? Do you think that I can take bones and make them stand erect in the body and breathe into Do you think that I can do this? Okay. So it looks like that's what he's um that's what he's trying to accomplish. Okay? Because he wants to prove and God doesn't really need to prove anything, but he wants Ezekiel to know that he's able. And he wants the bones that come to life to know that he's able. And to know that he's God and that he did it. Okay. So this is what it looks like he's trying to prove. All right, that he's trying to accomplish. So then it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, a suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews of the flesh came upon them, and the skin were covered, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Okay, so we see this now coming into play. So we now we've seen all these things that are, that, are, that are taking place right before the prophet's eyes. He's witnessing all of these things. Remember the Lord said to um, Israel, remember he said that you are my witnesses. Okay, so he's going to show you signs and wonders because he needs you to be able to give an account for those signs and wonders. He need, He's going to pull Ezekiel over to the side one day and say, Ezekiel, you remember when I put when I brought these bones back to life? You remember, you saw it. You were a witness to that. So this is what he does because, again, we are a witness to the fact that he is who he says he is and that there is no other and that no other has done what he has done. Okay? So this is um him, the, the our God, the Lord God, putting together um, these bones, putting flesh on the top of the bones, putting the sinews on the bones, okay, bringing the bones together, and making them stand upright, okay. So then he said, then if I'm going down to verse nine, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Okay, so we're finding out about these bones, okay, as we read along further. We're finding out that these bones were slain. Okay, so these bones were slain. Okay, so let's just, let me just look up something here. Um, I know what slain means, but I just want to see if it's it. They were like actually murdered or killed. Okay, yeah. All right. So these people were um, pretty much slaughtered, murdered. Okay. So this is going to be the state of Israel. This is what we're seeing right now. This is like this, this is basically what I just explained prior to um, going into this um, this scripture, um, where we're seeing the nation of Israel um, 
is being basically murdered, being butchered. Okay, so these are the bones of the slain, those who were killed. Okay, those who were slain. I don't, it could have been in the form of being martyred or whatever the case may be. Um, they were basically killed. Okay, um, and I believe all of this is uh, this is taking place as a result. The Lord said, "The day of the Lord." If you all remember, the day of the Lord. When the day of the Lord comes, the day of the Lord comes. The Lord is not coming with peace. He's coming with a sword. He's coming to, to uh, thresh the wine press, to tread the wine press. Okay. So what that means is, he's coming to for judgment. Judgment is just what it says. When he comes to this earth, when the Lord, the day of the Lord comes, the the Lord is coming to judge those. Okay, how is that? How are they going to get judged? It's the sword. He's coming with the sword, pestilence, and um, what is it? Sword, pestilence, and famine. Okay, so these bones that we're seeing are those who were slain as a result of those methods. Okay, some of these people may have um, been slain through the sword, uh, through pestilence, or through um, or through famine. Okay, um, either way, he brought them back together. So when you see the Lord, when the, the day of the Lord comes, there's going to be a large number of people that are going to perish as a result of that. This is not the time where he comes and it's just going to be peace and no, he's coming to basically issue judgment on those who martyred his, uh, martyred, who killed his people and defiled his temple. Okay, and you can read more about that in um, Jeremiah chapter fifty. All right. Okay, so we see um, that these were the slain. So he prophesied to the breath that they may live. He says, "So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army." Okay, so these were a lot of people. Okay, this is an exceedingly great army that perished. All right. So then he said, "Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. <clears throat> Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel." Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place in you, place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and have performed it, said the Lord. So this is the Lord saying all of these things. So here we see signs and wonders being played right now, right? We see the, the fact that these bones that were just bone, could you just envision this bones being scattered along the valley as he was, okay? Um, the Lord putting them together, <coughs> putting the sinews together on them, <coughs> putting all the sinews on them, putting flesh upon them, putting breath in them, <coughs> basically bringing them back to life. So what we see here playing out is pretty much a resurrection. We see a resurrection taking place right here. <coughs> He's raising up the dead. Because we know that in order to be resurrected, <coughs> you first have to die. Right? Now that can come in the form of a spiritual death. Or it can come in the form of a physical death. The, part, the bottom line is, we know that God operates in the spirit. So everything that he does is in the spirit. He doesn't operate in our realm because our realm is not the truth. He operates in the realm of the truth, which is the spirit. He does not <coughs> normally operate with the flesh because the flesh is of sin. The flesh, the flesh is of corruption. Okay. Oh, excuse me. So what we're seeing here is the Lord basically performing a miracle right before our eyes, performing a resurrection of the dead right here. This is what you see. So all he's doing is simply giving a command to breathe, giving a command to live, giving a command to um, giving a command to to basically arise and live. This is the resurrection. Okay, so we see something that was dead. Okay, we see this evidence as by the the dry bones. Okay, the bone the bones that were in the valley that perished, and now we see the the signs and wonders of the Lord bring it together an exceedingly great army okay so obviously this um these people have perished 
again, along the lines of um, the tribulation or, or Jacob's trouble with the sword, the famine, and pestilence. Okay, that's spoken about all throughout Ezekiel. You can read about that in um, the book of Isaiah. They talk about it the book of, uh, in the book of Jeremiah in terms of um, the, judgment on, the judgment that comes upon Israel and even Jerusalem <clears throat> and Judah. Okay. These are the ways in which the Lord said that they would be put to that these are the ways in which they will be judged. All right. So we just witness a miracle that is spoken that is evidence in scripture. Another miracle of the Lord basically raising the dead. Okay. So I say this to say, for those of you who are um for those of you who are weary, those of you who are weary. Those of you who have um, been walking with the Lord for some uh, some time now, those of you who have lost hope, because as it said in this text, because it says it right here, these people have basically, it, it says, uh, let me go down and find it. Okay, if you go down to um, 37 chapter, verse 11, it says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed said our bones are dry, our hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. When you when he says cut off, that means that um you basically have cut off means to be put to death. Like you've been cut off. Like he's cut you off. Like he's cut you from away from his presence. As if as if you're dead. All right. So this is Israel basically losing faith and losing hope. Okay, becoming weary, and um you lose faith. We see this played out again where um the prophet Elijah, when he was um battling with um Jezebel we can go to that right now when um Jezebel I'll show you that scripture as well um when Jezebel had uh when they had the big showdown at Mount Carmel the victory between the um the bells the um the, the prophets that worship Baal Elijah became weary Okay, these are the people that's going through a drought right now. These are the people that are, you know, walking with the Lord in righteousness. They're doing his work. They're doing his bidding. They're doing um, what they're asked to do. They've been in this for a while now. They're being persecuted severely. People, um, you tend to get a little ran down as, along the ways. And that, that's usually at the point of your, that's usually at the point of your, um, your breakthrough. When your breakthrough is right there, when your breakthrough is right there, Okay, that's when you become, that's when you start to get a sense of fatigue and exhaustion, okay, because you're just about done with your walk, and the enemy comes in like a flood, and he does, he comes in like a flood to try to drain you, he even brings your family in to try to stop you, he brings everyone around you to try to stop you from accomplishing your goal, because the whole focus is to get you off the track that you're walking with God, he doesn't want you to finish, he doesn't want you to finish, okay, he wants you to faint. Okay, the whole thing is to make you faint. But the Lord says, and he's showing you in this text, can these dry bones live? That's what he's asking. That's the question he wants to know. Am I not God? Do I not make it rain? Do I not make it snow? Do I not feed the birds of the air? Do, can, I not, can I not make your bones live? Can I not provide? Can I not give you hope? Can I not, can I not finish what I have started? This is what he's asking. When we look at this, this is exactly what he's asking. Like, can the dry bones live? Yes or no? That is basically asking you, do you have faith? Do you trust me that I can do this? Okay, do you trust me that I can do this? Okay, so Ezekiel's like, Lord God, you know, you know. He answered him. He's like, you know, of course. You know, I, that, that's, that's what Ezekiel response is. But he's also going to prove to Israel because, see, Israel lost hope. Israel said in the text, our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. They assume that they were cut off because of the trials that they're going through. I mean, have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought that God has given up on you? I, I mean, honestly, ask yourself that question. Have you? I, I have. I, I have. <laughs> so it's just like one of those things where, um, you know, you, you have to get yourself back in the game. You have to get yourself back in, and you have to realize that the Lord is faithful. Even when we're not faithful, He's faithful. And you have to realize that... Um, He's going to finish what he said he's going to do. Why? Because he said he's going to do it. And that's what he's going to do. Even when it doesn't look like he's going to do it. Even when it looks like it's impossible for him to do it. 
it, it all comes back to your way of your way of thinking is not his way of thinking. It all come, boils down to the battle is not yours, it's his. So don't try to figure it out in your own head. Don't try to work it out how he's gonna how he's gonna do it and how he's gonna accomplish it. That's not up for you to that's not up for you to figure out. It's not up for you to to wonder about. It's not up for you to decide how it's gonna play out. You have no level, you have no knowledge of um, his knowledge is unsearchable. You have no way of finding out how he's gonna do anything. So it's not even up for you to even try to figure it out and try to understand how he's going to do it because that's what makes him so amazing and that's what makes him so awesome. And this is this is one of the examples that make him so awesome is because when they gave up hope, the Lord was still faithful. And the Lord said, even though you gave up hope, Israel, even though you gave up hope and thought that I cut you off, even though your bones are dry and brittle, I'm going to bring them back to life because I want you to know that I did this for you. I want you to know, because you remember I told you back in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43 that you are my witnesses. I told you back in Isaiah chapter 43 that you are my witnesses. I have called you by your name. And I'm with you when you go through the water and I'm with you when you go through the fire. And by the way, just to let you know, these are this is the refining for Israel. When, it, when we're faced with all of these these um, persecutions, like I said, um, <clears throat> And one of the one of the way, ways that they probably perish when he, he doesn't say in the chapter, it just says that they were slain. He doesn't say how they were slain, but we know if you have a history or a knowledge on, on the teachings of um, or Bible prophecy in terms of Israel, how they would be put to how they would be judged is basically by the sword, famine, and by pestilence. And as a result of that, this is a refining that's being done. This is all for refining purpose. This is. So that you're refining. This is a part of the, the process of the fire, going through the fire. Going through that fiery trial. Okay. And some of you will faint when you go through it. But the Lord is good. The Lord said that he will redeem you. He already told Israel, I'm going to redeem you. So even if you perish, right, look at this example, he's going to bring you back. Because why? Because that's what he said he was going to do. He said you are redeemed. He holds your soul. His soul, he, he has your soul. Okay. So this is him putting them back together. Same example with Elijah. Okay. When you go up, when you go through a drought, and this is what this is. This is a drought. This is like a, you know, they were in the valley, it says. These bones were like down in the valley, you know, bones, and they were dry. From what? From a drought, from a storm, from a fiery trial. From It sounds like they were, they were drained. Okay. When you get to that point of exhaustion, where you just can't, when you can't push anymore. The Lord will push for you. He'll push for you. Okay, so it's just like um, what we see in the example. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you the, the example of um, what Elijah says. When he became weary. Okay, so Elijah got weary. So I'm looking at First Kings chapter, First Kings chapter 19, when Elijah escapes from Jezebel. Okay, so it says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to I to Elijah, saying, so this is what Jezebel sends the messenger to um, tell Elijah. So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Okay, so here you see Elijah just got done with a mighty battle where he basically succeeded. He just got done with a mighty battle. You could read about that in... Um, uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse uh, 20. This was, was a showdown with the Baals, okay? Where, um, you know, was God, you know, Elijah's God, which is the Lord, and um, the prophet's God, um, the Baals, who worshiped the Baals. Um, and he basically won a, they basically had a little a contest in which um, they called, they asked him, to, let, let me just go over it with you right quick. Um, I'll read from it. So I'm just going to start at, um, I'm going to start at verse, 
verse 23. Therefore, let them give to us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you will call the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire for he is God. So all the people answered and said it, it is well spoken. So here we see um, Elijah giving them, they're basically entering into a, um, a competition or a contest to show whose God is going to show up to take up the offering that they're about to, that they're putting, that they're putting down. And then, you know, and they didn't put any fire on, they're not going to put any fire on it. Okay. They're not going to put any fire under it, under the uh, offerings because they want the God to put the, the God that answers by fire to put under the, put the fire under it themselves. Right. Okay. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God and put it and put no fire under it. Why put no fire under it? So they're offering sacrifices, the sacrifice of a bull. They're not putting any fire under it because they want to know who's the God that answers by fire. Okay. Who is the God that answers by fire? All right. So they said that that, that was an instruction. Don't put no fire under it. All right. So they took the bull which was given to them and they prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Listen. So listen. So they prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning, evening, till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud again and cut themselves. They even cut themselves. Okay, this is how far they went. They cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. And when the midday had passed, they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So they don't went into a whole other, a different sacrifice. They, they can't even get the evening sacrifice um, done because they're still doing the sacrifice that they started with but there was no voice no one answered no one paid any attention so all this time they spent all day they prepped this bull put no fire on it all day they called out to, to the bell hoping that bell would answer them and bell didn't answer he didn't show up okay then elijah said to all the people come near at me so all the people came near to him and he prepared the altar of the lord that was broken down and Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of God had come, saying, "Israel shall be your name." So twelve stones, according to the twelve tribes of Israel, pretty much. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And said, "Listen to this now." Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So he's saturating. He's saturating the altar. He's saturating the sacrifices with water. And he's sacrificing the wood with water. And put water in the wood. He's drenching it with water. Okay. So it says, then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench with water. And it came to pass that at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things in your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell upon fell and consumed and burnt the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and then licked up the water that was in the trench. Listen to this. So God, who showed up? The bell or the true and living God? Who showed up? The true and living God. The Lord God showed up. And not only did he take the sacrifice, he licked up the water. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? So of course, the prophets of Baal what did they what did they do? Okay. So they see all of this. They see all of this happen. That's what they did. Now the people saw it and they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God, 
the Lord. He's got, what else can you do at that? I mean, what else could you do at a sign such as that? I mean, they called on their, their God from all day. He ain't show up. He wasn't going to show up. And he wasn't going to show up. He wasn't going to show up because he wasn't the truth. He's not the truth. See, the truth never shows up. I mean, not the truth never shows up. The lie never shows up. Okay? The, the, they, they want you to believe the lie in secret. But when a lie gets around the truth, the lie will always stand you up. Okay? Because the lie ain't going to show up because he's a lie. Okay? He's a liar. So whenever the truth comes around or whenever you being, whenever you know that the truth is around and you know that the servant is the truth, okay? The servant is a man of faith and a believer and he knows that his God isn't going to leave him standing there. The lie ain't going to show up. The lie is not going to show up. He only wants you to believe the lie in secrecy, okay? He only shows you I can do these things in secret. But when he knows that the true and living God is looking at the whole thing, he ain't going to come. He ain't going to be nowhere in sight. He ain't going to show up. No, nope, show ain't. So then it says, um, and Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. So there you see, so Elijah did this, did this mighty act. It was, by the way, it was 450 prophets. I didn't, I didn't read that part. But if you look, um, if you look at, uh, where did it say that at? I don't know, you can look at it um, somewhere along the line, but there were like 450 prophets that um, showed up at that bell, that, at that whole thing. And um, <clears throat> Elijah had them executed. Elijah had them executed. And guess who these people were? Guess who the prophets were? Israel. They were Israel. So... You know, Elijah is Israel. The prophets were Israel. So now Elijah is in a situation where he's like, when we read it, when we read in um, chapter 19, he says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the, let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as one of those by tomorrow or about this time. And when he saw that, Elijah ran for his life. But the thing is, Elijah ran for his life. But you look at and you look at the thing and say, well, why did Elijah run for his life? He just got done doing this mighty act. And he just had God show up but with fire. And he did this amazing, this amazing things. Why? Because he lost hope. Because guess why? These are his people. These are his people. Jezebel is his people. Jezebel, Jezebel is Israel. These are his people that want to kill him. Can you do you know what that feels like? Your own people that want to kill you? Do you know how that feels? And he felt isolated. This is, a, again, feeling hopeless, feeling like losing all hope. Like, well, Dad, we just, I just had 450 of them um, uh, killed with the sword. And now Jezebel, she's, now she's going to come after me. So it says, but he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. Elijah prayed that he might die. You know how mighty Elijah was. You know the prophet Elijah. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my fathers. This is weariness. This is, this is being tired. This is being exhausted. This is him coming to the same, like, I can't do it anymore. I just did this mighty act. I'm done. I'm exhausted. I've done all I can do. And the Lord says, and you can tell, like, he, he wanted to die. He just sat down. It's like he fainted. Like, it, I'm, 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 I can't do it no more. I can't do it anymore. He prayed that he may die. Okay. And here you go. If you look down in, in verse uh, chapter 10, he said, So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. Have you ever got to the point? Have you ever got to that point? Where you just like. Yeah Lord I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I, I had enough. I'm, I'm drained. Lord I'm exhausted. Lord take my life. I'm exhausted. I can't do it anymore. It is enough. Have you ever gotten to that point? The dry bones can they, can they, can they live? Point. The, I'm zealous for your house and there is none left. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. 
your your prophets have killed the people, your people who you have made a covenant with are killing your people and they seek my life now. But the good news was, I'm going to read to you what the, the, the Lord's response was to um, Elijah in verse uh, chapter 15. And the Lord God says to him, wait a minute, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay, so here we go. So the Lord says to him, in verse 18, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed them. So here you, so here you have it. So the Lord has on reserve. He's telling you right here, even though Elijah said that I'm the only one left and they seek to take my life. The Lord says in verse 18, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, in every mouth that has not kissed him. That's still a lot of people. Seven thousand. The Lord always has a remnant. Okay. The Lord always has a remnant. Even when it looks like you're alone in the battle, because Elijah was clearly alone. He was. The, I mean, he it was him and his servant. At least Elijah had a servant. I'm here. I'm alone. But it, it's just like you don't have. You know, it's one of those things where you become. You know, it, it's like one of those things like, dang, am I the only one going through all of this? Am I the only one that's having this level of tribulation, having this this level of, of strife and uh, persecution to the point where it can make you weary? It can, it can wear you down. But the Lord was, um, he honored his request because he um, had him go and anoint uh, Elisha, who was going to take over and finish the work and for, as far as the house of Ahab goes. So, but these are one of these things, like you can be a mighty, you can be a mighty warrior and you can be mighty, you can just have accomplished a victory and everything. But then when you find out there's still more to go. And, and you're still being threatened, and you 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 see that they're not even convinced that you're God. Like he, I guess Elijah's. I'm looking at looking at it from Elijah Elijah's perspective. I'm thinking he thought maybe Jezebel would have been convinced that the Lord is God, considering that 450 of her prophets died at the sword, and um, it's, especially after hearing all of the things that took place. I'm thinking that he would have thought Jezebel would have got off his back. But no, Jezebel was even more angry and said that and even threatened him as if it was going to come to pass. Like she said, if, if I, with confidence, she threatened him. Like if I do not make your life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time, do to me as, the, as you have done to the gods. Like she was confident with that, with that threat. Like if I don't finish what you've done, if I don't finish you off, do to me what you've done to the gods. Okay, so that's something to um, that's just something to um, consider. So when you, whenever you get tired, just look at that scripture, Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven. Can these bones, son of man, can these bones live? Nothing is impossible for God. Um, look at the the uh, you know, Elijah, the whole situation with Elijah. You will get tired. I can't say that you won't. I'll be lying to you if, you, if I didn't tell you that. But the Lord knows um, your threshold. He knows there's a certain level at which you can continue to go and which you can't go. And um, you just continue to um, do the best you can. And um, speak to him and seek him. Speak to him and, and let him know. And um, take it from there. Okay? Shalom. I hope this blessed you. 
and prepare and uh, give your life to Christ. For the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord is imminent. Um, surrender your lives to Christ. Repent and receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Shalom.